It is Friday, February 25th, and you're locked into Real Talk. This episode is going to move fast. It is a stacked one. We're going to the experts on the stories that everybody's talking about this week, which means we've got a lot to talk about. In just a second, Gerald Butts. In 10 minutes, Minister Randy Boissonneau. We're going to review the Alberta budget with veterans, scribes, Kelly Kreiderman, Graham Thompson, and then... A Real Talk Roundtable, our Friday tradition on conspiracy theories. This is going to be driven by a personal story. We've got a panelist joining us. Sue Muncaster uh, wrote a piece for the Huffington Post. My gentle, intelligent brother is now a conspiracy theorist, and his beliefs are shocking. Sue will be joined by Justin Ling and Anna Merlin for what I know will be a great conversation. That's coming up in about 40, 45 minutes from now. This entire show is presented every day by the team at Bitcoin. Well, they know that everybody's talking about cryptocurrency more than usual because of the Emergencies Act. We'll get into that with Gerald, generally speaking, in just a second. People are talking about access to finances and free flow of economic activity and the government's role in that if you have questions about it if that's your thing if you'd like to learn more i recommend talking in person or online with the team at bitcoin well you'll find them under the sponsors tab on our website ryanjesperson.com real talk starts right now here's ryan jesperson we're getting right into it today. I mean, you know, Russia advancing on Ukraine. Kiev uh, threatened, of course. Uh, the Chernobyl nuclear site has has been compromised, so says uh, Ukraine's uh, political leadership. There's a lot going on there, of course, here at home as well. The Emergencies Act pulled away from the Senate as it was lifted uh, by the governing liberals. You've got the blockade dissipating in Ottawa, but still promises from many of those protesters that they're not done yet. A convoy approaching Washington, D.C. in the United States. The federal conservatives are looking for a leader. The Alberta budget's out. The federal budget's about to come out. Gerald Butts knows a thing or two about this kind of stuff. He's the vice chairman, senior advisor at Eurasia Group. He's a longtime political consultant at senior levels, both provincially and federally, including as the former principal secretary to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. You've seen him as well uh, in public and private sector leadership for more than 20 years, including the World Wildlife Fund Canada. He's making his Real Talk debut this morning. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for making time for us. It's great to be here, Ryan. Long time uh, listener, first time caller, as I say. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. You know, you're you're a guy that obviously has had his finger on the pulse of political developments, both domestically and internationally over the years. I'll ask you the question generally on purpose. How are you wrapping your mind around what you're seeing in Ukraine right now? Well, first of all, you have to. um, I'm half Ukrainian, so I'm uh, uh, personally uh, horrified by this. And, uh, I feel like we've been watching and describing the Eurasia group, a slow motion train wreck for the past several months. It's a very difficult thing to watch. It was predictable that it was going to happen. And, um, I guess we can only take some hope that the long-term losers in this will be the people perpetrating this, uh, war crime. The government of Canada says that it will impose sanctions on the Russian elites, and there's there's talk about influencing SWIFT, this ability for Russian banks to, to participate in the global economy. Sounds like that's a last resort. The prime minister facing questions yesterday, as was President Joe Biden, on why they're not sanctioning Vladimir Putin personally and why those aren't more focused measures. What do you make of the role that Canada takes in a situa- situation like this, and, and how do you know if it's the right one? Well, I think personally, and I'm, of course, only speaking for myself these days, Ryan, I think the role that Canada should take is to be a very strong and cohesive team player in NATO. There's only one force at our disposal that can um, deter and face up to a force as large as the Russian, uh, as what the Russians can put on the field, and that's NATO. And it's really, really important that Canada act as a cohesive force within um, the alliance. It's interesting. You talk to global leaders. I thought that British Prime Minister Boris Johnson spoke very powerfully yesterday. And obviously, we've heard similar sentiments expressed by the, the French president and obviously leaders around the world, uh, including Canada's deputy uh, prime minister, Christia Friedland, who was talking about, you know, redefining or Russia's attempt to redraw borders in Europe, you know, decades after World War Two. It's the first time that the world has seen really any aggression like this, particularly in Europe in, in more than 20 years globally. How significant is this? Well, look, I work with a lot of people who've had experience, long-term career experience in um, agencies like the CIA and the State Department. uh, And we 
in general, who asked one of the most experienced of them yesterday on our morning call, how would you rate this on a scale of one to 10? And he said, eight. Uh, it's the most significant geopolitical event that's happened since 9-11 and possibly since the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't, I, we're, we're used to living, Ryan, in a, in a media environment where everything is blown out of proportion all of the time and everything's the biggest thing that ever happened. This is a really serious geopolitical event that will reshape the global order. I'm not sure you know, how deep it, or how much of an opinion, how strong of an opinion you may have on this particular angle. It's one that I'm keeping an eye on. I know that, that sort of at the grassroots or at the sidewalk level, as we say, people are being told, listen, gas prices could go up as a result of this. There's talking about sanctioning Russia's energy industry and revenues there. And a lot of people are saying global oil prices could sp- spike it could be ultimately in a way bad news for alberta and canadian oil at least in the short term uh what does intuitive leadership look like and, and for those that are keeping an eye on markets etc how should they wrap their minds around these next number of weeks well look uh, uh russia's economy is largely based on oil and gas and if their supply to europe they supply about half of europe's gas uh is disrupted it's going to have a huge impact it's already had an impact on prices and we expect at Eurasia Group that that impact will last uh, for a while. I think that um, um, by any objective reckoning of these events, it's bad for the global economy and it's certainly bad for global energy markets. How, how are you wrapping your mind? You were one of the people I thought of when I saw this, you know, this convoy making its way to Ottawa. And, and I'm not sure whether, you know, people say Ottawa police underestimated the convoy. I think probably the general population uh, maybe underestimated the convoy with regards to its staying power and the impact it might inflict, not just on Ottawa, but the Ambassador Bridge, the Coots border blockade was another interesting one. Um, in, in your mind, as you monitor developments and how they were managed at different levels of government, you know, Ottawa's Mayor Jim Watson has had sit his say on it. People have talked about Premier Doug Ford's performance, the Prime Minister's as well. Ottawa's police chief resigned. I know I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> uh, was the Emergencies Act the right lever to pull? And do you think that was the game changer in breaking this up? Or how did you assess what you saw over the, the three weeks or so? Well, I think your assessment is a pretty good one. Nobody comes out of this one covered in glory, that's for sure. No source of authority in the country, starting with the Ottawa Police Service. It's unconscionable to me, as someone who worked in the Prime Minister's office for almost four years, that you would escort these people down to Wellington Street. And um, if if you were planning to cause the maximum jurisdictional havoc in this country, you would have parked those trucks exactly where they parked them, because... Um, While it's technically the jurisdiction of the Ottawa police, everybody in the country thinks that national authorities are responsible for the parliamentary precinct. So it created chaos um, and everybody was slow to respond. To answer your question directly, Ryan, I think that the Emergencies Act was justified. Um, One of the best things about the Emergencies Act is within it, it triggers uh, an inquiry into its use and how it was used and why it was used and what the consequences were. So I wouldn't want to prejudge any of the deliberations that will go into that outcome. Um, but I think the results speak for themselves. We had a deeply entrenched insurrectionist movement in downtown Ottawa. And a few days after the act was invoked, they were gone. Gerald Butts, our guest, uh, there was talk about how this occupation was essentially an attempt to undermine Canada's democracy. And as we learned more about the sources of funding and where they were coming from, and in some cases, who was contributing those funds, it became apparent that there were foreign sources or foreign influences in an attempt to undermine Canadian democracy. Is that a dramatic way to put it, or do you think it's accurate? I mean, to which degree or to what extent do you think Canadian democracy was threatened? Well, look, the stated are, the stated aims of the people who showed up here or their leadership was to replace the duly elected government elected just a few months ago with, um, <laughs> it's almost ridiculous to say it, Ryan, but with an oversight body headed by the Governor General and the Senate of Canada that would uh, override the, legisl- the democratically legislated laws of the country. I don't know what that is. If that's not an insurrection, I don't know what an insurrection is. So uh, I, do subscri- I do subscribe to that view. Um, I would say, however, that it's easy to point fingers and say that there are uh, big, scary people outside the country that orchestrated all of this. And while they funded it, um, and added uh, money was an accelerant to it. It's really important for us as Canadians to look ourselves in the mirror and realize that this was 
a homegrown movement. There were a lot of Canadians involved and they came here uh, to do what they did. And it's, I think it's important for us not to blame other people for that. There's so much going on right now. I mean, our show today is going to be evidence of it. I mean, you know, the budget was just pushed out in Alberta yesterday and yeah. it's going to take us a half hour to get to it, Gerald, to give, to give you some yeah. perspective here. Um, a big part of the national conversation, I think right now, and I think it's happening in hockey arenas in so many ways as it's happening at higher levels, maybe around boardroom tables is whether or not the country is in fact divided, damaged, is if there's a permanent rift that exists, what's what's your assessment of the state of Canada right now and its people? Well, look, I mean, I <laughs> I uh, lived through the Quebec referendum in 1995 when we almost lost the country by uh, less than one percentage point. Uh, I think it's important to take a long term historical view of these things. And I think there are lots of people who would love Canadians to believe that we're deeply divided both within the country and uh, beyond it. I think once you get outside the echo chamber of the political classes and you talk to people um, who you went to high school with, Ryan, I think that there's more that we have in common than divides us. And uh, I, I, I do not subscribe to the view that we're there are irreconcilable differences amongst Canadians. I think that we have so much, we have as much, if not more, in common than we ever have. Yeah, I appreciate that assessment. Uh, your, your dad or doc or, or grandfather doesn't have to be an oncologist, do they? Uh, my brother is an oncologist. Your brother, apparently, your brother, yes. your brother is is uh, apparently quote uh, a, an amazing cancer doc for one of our live tuners moms. So how about that? A wow. small world. Uh, Gerald Butts Fantastic. is vice chair of uh, Eurasia Group, and of course was a former principal secretary of the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Thanks for your time. It's really good to see your face again. Good to see you too, Ryan. Yeah, appreciate well. it. You can let us know what you think about what you're hearing here. Uh, on the live chat, of course, you can also hit us up on our uh, hashtag Real Talk RJ. You know, that's powered by our friends at Park Power who want me to remind you they're your friendly local utilities provider, electricity, natural gas and Internet. I know a lot of you go, they provide Internet. They do. And they bundle their services, which means if you go to parkpower.ca right now, you can not only compare rates, but if you bundle your services, you're going to save on admin costs. That's one way to save. Another way is to make sure you use the promo code 2022-REALTALK when you sign up. When you bring your business over there, 2022-REALTALK at parkpower.ca gets you $70 off your first bill. Friesen Brothers, you know them proudly Alberta-grown, Alberta-owned for more than 65 years. Originally founded by the legendary... Frank Loveson, still a family-owned, family-run company in 16 different Alberta communities. I'm giving you the heads up. It's in less than a week from now, just a few days, the first of the month. It means it's 15% off all grocery purchases over $75 at Friesen Brothers. So I should say a minimum $75 purchase. They'll give you 15% off the whole thing on the first of the month at Friesen Brothers. You can find them online at Friesen.com. A big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Michelle in their ownership group reaches out to me. She says, I think Real Talkers would probably want to know about our brand new burger menu. They've upgraded their already formidable burger menu. Check out the Two Cheese Deluxe Signature Stack Burger, the Bacon Two Cheese Deluxe Signature Stack Burger, the Flamethrower, the Loaded A1, and of course you've got the Original Cheeseburger one of the things that put the DQs on the map in Palisades, De Mayo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. When you pick up from the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, you let them know you're there because of real talk. We're going to check in with uh, Federal Tourism uh, Minister. He's the Associate Minister of Finance federally as well, uh, Randy Boisno, out of the Riding of Edmonton Centre in just a second. Pre-budget consultations underway. He's been participating in those. I think they just wrapped today, as a matter of fact. We'll ask him. Federal budget coming. Plus, of course, COVID implications for travel. And he's sitting around the cabinet table. What was talk like around that Emergencies Act? And, of course... Uh, what's the play right now on Russia, Ukraine? I mean, we know ahead of time he's going to be coy. He's going to say, I'll defer to my colleagues in the Ministry of Defense and Foreign Affairs in the Prime Minister's office. But we'll ask those questions to the minister in just a second. I appreciate this email. We get a ton. Uh, trash talk today. Uh, we could do three of them in a row. I mean, there's so much that you have to talk about and have to say. Michael wrote in to us. He says, as, I, as I'm praying tonight for Ukraine, my mind flooded with childhood memories I thought I'd forgotten. Memories of my junior high teacher, Mr. Young, trying to reiterate the importance of understanding world events. 
in the 90s, it was almost this like Nintendo-esque kind of footage of the Iraq war. You remember that? I mean, the, the night vision type shots. He says, you know, remembering there was a sticker on my parents' windshield of our car that gave them permission to drive into the Medley Air Force town. Uh, they were civilian teachers working on the base. They needed that clearance. And, and driving by the base gated with one or two military police officers, I think about the cruise missile tests that the Americans would perform. They landed in the Cold Lake region, often where I grew up, and the, the weekly irregular sounds of CF-18s flying over my house, uh, sitting in the cockpit uh, of a fighter jet as a child and, and watching the simulator because I was lucky enough that my Boy Scouts leader had connections. Michael says these memories are part of who I am. Uh, as a kid that grew up during that sort of final or closing chapter of the Cold War, and I have this terrible feeling that Putin's attacks are the start of something more, and I hope that I'm wrong and simply tired from the pandemic as a community we need to reach out to our ukrainian friends to agencies and to give them our support michael says pray for ukraine stay safe and look after each other that's mike chiming in from calgary we really appreciate that uh, the honorable randy Bosno is canada's minister of tourism associate minister of finance uh, representing the riding of edmonton center which he just took back in the most recent federal election won it then lost it then came back and re-entered the scene in ottawa first elected as an mp in 2015 of course, uh, one of five, fo uh, five openly gay MPs elected in 2015, by the way, the first to be elected from Alberta. And it's always a pleasure to welcome Minister Boisneau to the show. Thanks for making time for us. Uh, for those, I mean, most will hear this on a podcast. Some will see it on YouTube and they'll be able to see the color scheme of your tie. Uh, that's a pretty loud and definitive statement in support of Ukraine. Uh, let me ask you what it's like right now. In, I mean, you know, the first 48 hours of a, an invasion, undeniably sitting around this cabinet table in Ottawa, this relatively speaking, a first for you in your political career. Can you take us in the room as much as you can? I heard your preamble, Ryan, and I um, I thank you for the introduction. And I, I am wearing a, a tie that was uh, designed by a Ukrainian Canadian artist right here in my own writing of Edmonton Center. And I think I want to I want to reach out to all Ukrainian Canadians and all Canadians right now because we stand with Ukraine uh, steadfastly. Um, this attack on a sovereign nation is the greatest threat to the international rules-based order since the Second World War. And Ryan, I um, I grew up with and um, have lifelong friends who are Ukrainians. I mean, quite frankly, we have Petahe and Holopchi as part of our all of our weddings and all of our Christmas and New Year's and Easter celebrations. That's how integrated the communities are here in Edmonton and in Alberta. And uh, just last night, one of my longest and, and dearest friends uh, is in town with his wife and three kids. They live in uh, New York now, but he's Ukrainian Canadian. She's from Kiev. They're here. And we were all at the rally last night, just, you know, trying to come together with probably 500 or a thousand people that um, like us are doing everything we can to stop Putin. Um, he has now Ryan joined the ranks of the most reviled despots in the 20th century. People are dying. Uh, in the streets of Ukraine, and uh, Canada will continue to do everything that we can to support Ukraine. Y you will know the sanctions that we've put in place, and um, they are serious sanctions. We've sent over $600 million in loan money. We've sent uh, lethal aid. Uh, we continue to work with NATO and our international partners to increase sanctions. We have now sanctioned all of the members of parliament of, the, um, of, of Russia. We have uh, targeted another 50 of uh, Putin's closest inner circle, including oligarchs. We've shut down access to two Russian banks. And um, and there's more to come. And that's why we are working with our international partners every day, every hour. Uh, why not sanction Vladimir Putin himself? You know, that's a, a good question. And I think what we're trying to do is choke off uh, his the access to the people around him and make sure that they are um, understanding the pain that they are inflicting on Ukraine by hitting them where it matters most. I mean, this is an authoritarian state, Ryan. We've got to get to the people that enable Putin and they are billionaire oligarchs. And the, what they understand is access to their financial resources. And so our uh, approach is to uh, choke off those financial resources, to appeal to the Russian people, to continue to provide supports to uh, Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. And that is why we have our troops uh, right on the border to our training troops to uh, that have really helped through Operation Unifier get the Ukrainian army to the state where it is now. Um, but we will continue to escalate, Ryan, and uh, we're happy to keep you informed of the escalating sanctions as they are announced. Yeah, I appreciate you taking 
asking these questions. I mean, as I acknowledge to our audience, too, you know, quite fairly, you could say to us, well, this is more for uh, my colleagues in the Ministry of, of, you know, Defense or Foreign Affairs, obviously, or the PMO. I appreciate you taking the questions. One more sure. on, on Russia, Ukraine Please. and sanctions. Your Associate Minister of Finance. I mean, a, a, to what degree, you know, I think that the average civilian may wonder if, you know, is the sanction designed to sort of try to squeeze out the, this Russian influence? And within 72 hours, I hear a lot of expert voices saying this could take quite some time for Russia to feel this pain. This could be more of a long term play, just part of the playbook. What's sort of the general forecast of when you do or, or when you are or are not able to assess whether or not those sanctions are effective? The sanctions will take some time to have an effect. There's no sugarcoating that and there's no way to you know have a political answer on that your your information is is right and we've heard leaders around the world mention that but we have to do it and we have to keep escalating and we have to show russia that invading a sovereign nation invading ukraine comes with a cost i mean ryan it is completely unacceptable and egregious that you can turn back 70 years of history and all of a sudden overnight decide that um, might makes right and roll tanks into the borders of a sovereign nation. And to your question um, about what can people do who are worried and nervous, I want to share a number with you and your listeners. Sure. Uh, sure. This is a consular number for Ukrainians and Canadian citizens in the region. It's 613-321-4243. It's a dedicated line. And I would encourage everybody to follow the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, the UCC Facebook and the UCC Alberta Facebook, because this afternoon, my colleague, the Minister of Immigration, Citizenship and Refugees, uh, Sean Fraser, is going to be having a, a seminar, a webinar on what people can do uh, to help their families that are in distress. And yeah. it is a dire situation on the ground, Ryan. So uh, we need people to shelter in place. We need people to get to safety if it's safe to do so. And uh, we want everybody uh, to stay safe and healthy in uh, a time of this uh, this great tragic invasion. I mean, these the, the uh, images are, are difficult to ignore. I mean, just absolutely gridlock traffic, uh, people trying to flee the cities, and you kind of wonder where are they going? Many of them trying to cross into Poland, we know. I saw a video last night, like cell phone video of, uh, you know, NICU babies. We're talking newborns, Minister, uh, some of them on life support in the parkade of a neonatal intensive unit, a hospital that had been nearby uh, some pretty targeted bombing. So obviously, I think that the perspective is there uh, for for everybody let's talk about the emergency on on home soil i'm certainly not comparing the two if anything it's a perspective check uh but you would have been sitting around uh, the cabinet table and obviously in caucus as uh, the idea was floated whether or not to invoke the emergencies act for the first time since it was introduced in 1988 and then to lift it uh 10 days later uh, some looking back and of course there will be the the review the inquiry etc um some will say look at it it was the right time to bring it in it was the right move everything dissipated everything got under control no longer an emergency let's get it out of there others say it should never have been there in the first place uh, how healthy was the debate around the cabinet or, or caucus tables uh, with regards to the decision to invoke it in the first place it's a great question ryan and i appreciate the opportunity to talk about it as we um, as the situation unfolded and um look had this been a legal protest um, over uh, a disagreement in policy, um, and it was happening peacefully on the grounds of the of Parliament Hill, um, it could likely still be going on. But you simply can't take over a city. You can't shut down city streets. You can't choke off uh, critical infrastructure. Um, you saw the weapons cache that the RCMP got at Coots. And um, while it looked like this was a disagreement over vaccine mandates, there was something much darker at the core of this. And it was designed and advertised as um, a campaign to overthrow a duly elected government. And I can say that we have mechanisms in place if people disagree with an election, they should stand for election in, in the next time it comes around. And that's the system we have. That's the democracy we have. And when uh, lives and livelihoods are put at stake, when we have multiple premiers reaching out to us for help because uh, the uh, resources they had at their disposal weren't adequate, um, then it meets the, the threshold of that of the act. And I can tell you, Ryan, at the Ambassador Bridge, uh, shutting that down every day cost our economy $390 million. At Coots, it was $48 million. At Emerson, it was $73 million. And that that affects small businesses. That affects workers. I mean, we have 90% of truckers vaccinated and they couldn't get their goods across the board. We had cattle and cattle feed not being able to cross the border. And so when you put all of that together um, and the fact that the rule of law was not being put in place um, by the police forces because of 
their uh, access to a limited set of tools. That is why we very carefully, very deliberately designed uh, the approach we took to the Emergencies Act to choke off the financing to the uh, illegal blockades and occupation, to let people know very clearly that if they continue to support them, that they would lose their license, possibly lose their, their, their property, and that legal protest is always protected. And, and I think, Ryan, the other thing that people should know is that the Emergencies Act was designed by the Brian Mulroney government to be fully compliant with the charter. Mm -hmm. And that was our number one guiding star. And we also said, once we invoked it, the first hour, the first day that we could revoke it, we would. And how did we get there? Well, we got information from our intelligence services, from the banks and from the RCMP, that there was no more threat to national security. And that's how we were able to revoke it within 10 days. I can ask you about your pre-budget consultations in, in just sure. a second, but you're obviously the federal minister of tourism. And uh, mm. I, if I know you, I know you're up for a challenge and who doesn't love tourism? Uh, it helps us <laughs> when they come to us and it benefits us when we get to go to them and explore planet Earth. But obviously the challenges that face us now uh i i almost uh, i don't want to say it i'll say the word they're unprecedented to a certain degree so how does how do you rebuild canada's tourism industry where do you gauge with your finger on the pulse minister where are people at with regards to air travel with with regards to, to, to yep. you know being able to pack festival venues i know edmonton in our hometown folk music festivals coming back everybody's excited about that how are you finding your balance how are you gauging where the public's at and how do you ease canada back into a pretty healthy economic landscape on the tourism front and it's a really great way that you phrase the question, and it is unprecedented. I mean, how do you run a business when your clientele goes to zero? Yeah. You don't. You shut the doors. And so, Ryan, I'm going to share a number with you that is from my you know, finance responsibilities. And, and the government made a decision to invest heavily in the lives and livelihoods of Canadians, Edmontonians, Albertans, so that we could bounce back as an economy. And we invested $511 billion dollars in the lives of Canadians, in our businesses, in our provinces, in our municipalities, so that the economy can come back. It has come back. We're at about 101% of the 3 million jobs lost are back. Uh, that compares to about 84% in the US. The size of the economy is two and a half trillion, which is where we predicted it would be in budget 2018. And um, we have the, an annualized growth rate of 7.4%. But let's go back to tourism because I got to thank everybody who's listening, who runs an inn, who runs a hotel, who runs a tourism business, who is in that sector, because we know how hard you're hit. And Ryan, tourism is Alberta's number two export. Like oil and gas is number one, but who knew that tourism is number two? Because we've got Jasper, we've got Banff, we've got Waterton, that's one, two, and nine in the list of most uh, traveled to national parks. We've got our amazing in festivals, the country? Our amazing events. It's, the, yeah, one, wow. two, and nine in the country right here in Alberta. Wow. So- We've got $8.4 billion coming to our province every month, every year. And we want to take that to 20 billion in partnership with the province and all the municipalities. But to do that, we've got to get people back. Yeah. And I can tell you, Ryan, the first time somebody comes to Canada, they come back four more times. They fall in love with our province. They fall in love with our country and they come back and they explore and they, they spend a lot of money and they keep our businesses rolling. Look, 56% of tourism jobs are in rural Alberta, rural Canada. Think mm -hmm. about that. So this is the lifeblood for a lot of our smaller and medium-sized communities. People coming here want an authentic Indigenous experience. They want to have great food. They want to have a great experience. They want to get to the great outdoors. They want to have the arts and culture experience. And we've got it all. And we're going to have the safest jurisdiction in the world to travel to. So that's why no more PCR tests as of Monday. You, know, you can use them, but you can go for a rapid antigen. The kids don't have to have the vaccines anymore. We're going from level three to level two. And my job, Ryan, is to push my colleagues to, to make that border less thick every day. And I said to the tourism sector, safety first, then travel. So yeah, yeah. that's my job inside the shop is pushing. I'm I, safety first, then travel. I get it uh, to a certain degree. <laughs> Easier said than done, but you're the federal minister. Yeah. You can, you can do your, you know, you do what you can to make that happen. I, I just know how I feel personally, Randy, I know. and how I, I feel know. personally is that I don't want to be an idiot and go to a big, huge room full of people and get COVID and then spread COVID to a bunch of people. And also I want to be in a big, huge room with a bunch of people. You know what I mean? I'm like both. And I'm trying to find a way to reconcile them. And I'm trying to keep an eye on hospital numbers and listen to the experts. And it's easy to sit in this chair because thousands of people tell us how they feel. So, that, and I know that that's the same with you. Listen, I'm going to run out of time and we got to talk Alberta's budget, but you've been doing in closing sure. here, uh, pre-budget consultations. You're the associate minister of finance federally. Uh, you've been doing this for about a month. Uh, yeah. 2022 budget widely expected to be tabled late next month or maybe early April. But, but generally speaking, what have you been hearing from people? What we've been hearing from people is they are contributing great ideas on how to grow the economy, on how to make sure that we uh, invest um, wisely and heavily in housing, 
on uh, the importance of tackling the um, uh, what we're seeing is labor shortages. Think about that. We've just been through a global pandemic, and what are we hearing? Labor shortages. So that's how we know the economy is is coming back at, at full at full tilt. We've also heard about how important it is for here, for Alberta, to really demonstrate to Canadians and to the world what we can do in developing that greenest barrel of oil, the hydrogen file, the working with people uh, in the in the clean tech and green tech, but also making sure that this evolution of energy that we're in is a very worker centric approach that we are demonstrating to the country what we can do. And I can tell you the big producers in this province are already ahead of where the government wants to get on net zero. So I've heard a lot. Uh, Albertans have been very vocal in the pre-budget consultations. And I do think this is going to be a a very economic growth focused budget that brings everybody along. All right, good stuff. We'll await the details and look forward to the next time we can connect. The Honorable Randy Boisno is Canada's uh, tourism minister, also the associate minister of finance. Thanks for your availability. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All the best, Ryan. See you you bet. Uh, We'll dig into Alberta's budget in in literally 60 seconds uh, with two of the best in the business. If you ask me, uh, Graham Thompson, Kelly Kreiderman are going to join us. That budget uh, dropped, of course, yesterday. And uh, (laughs) nobody would blame you if you didn't quite realize that. You're going, wait a second. I usually know what's going on. But I was focusing yesterday big time on what's going on in Ukraine. Nobody would blame you. That's the big story. And And then the Emergencies Act being lifted. And what does that mean? And then, and then, and then. Oh, yeah. Right. It's easy to lose track. That's why you got to make sure you tune into Real Talk. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast and to our YouTube channel. So it's there waiting for you when you open up your phone. The show happens because of amazing partners like Athabasca University. By now, if you're a regular on this show, you know that Athabasca U is Canada's online university. World class accredited online programs and courses offer you the flexibility to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle you can browse their programs and courses today at athabascau.ca if you think it might be a right fit check out their wide variety of distance learning programs now here's the deal you don't have to sign up to get a, a bachelor of arts or a bachelor of science or a bachelor of commerce you can take one course and see how you feel about it see if it's a good fit see if it works for you and then just go from there the drop down menu how au works gives you a clear explainer of how it's structured and why so many Canadians are going to Athabasca U for their post-secondary or adult education experience. Our friends at Kubi Energy want to remind you that they've got an excellent resource on their blog. It's a drop-down menu on their website at kubienergy.ca. Jake, the CEO over there, I talked to him. I said, what's one of the things you think that you'd really like us to hammer home when we're talking about Kubi Energy? He says the fact that so many people are leaving so much money on the table. There are rebates and improvement programs and grants and all sorts of incentives for people that want to pursue their sustainable energy goals. They've got it all laid out for you. The links and, of course, the expertise to make it happen. They do all the paper work for you when you partner with Kubi Energy at kubienergy.ca. We're going to be talking to Graham Thompson and Kelly Kreiderman in just a second. Wanted to let you know as well, in about 10 minutes time, we're going to get into a Real Talk Roundtable. It's a Friday tradition for us on conspiracy theories. It's Sue Muncaster that'll lead us off a moving piece in the Huffington Post about her brother's experience. She says he's kind, he's intelligent, he's now a full-blown conspiracy theorist, Justin Ling and Anna Merlin, a journalist, will be joining us as well. But let's talk dollars and cents. Alberta's budget dropped yesterday. We're talking again about a potential surplus budget. For the first time in a long time, Kelly Kreiderman and Graham Thompson have been keeping an eye on it. Of course, Kelly, a Calgary-based journalist and a columnist with the Globe and Mail, a Graham, an award-winning journalist, uh, a fixture on the Alberta political scene, uh, featured in CBC, iPolitics, Alberta Views, and more formerly of the Edmonton Journal. A good morning to the both of you. Uh, Kelly, when I say that we're looking at a, a surplus budget, and then I catch myself and I say potentially because the hugest part of this, I mean, is this the lead line on the budget? Oil royalties, energy royalties, this is the big Absolutely. story again? Absolutely. It is a gusher of money, of course, based on a rising oil price over the last year and, a, and an amazing turnaround. The story is that, like, if you think about where we were a year ago, we were predicting a $18 billion deficit for last year. Now that's almost gone away. And we're going to have a surplus uh, next year. It is a stunning turnaround. Uh, Economist Trevor Toome has talked about this being the 
biggest turnaround in Alberta financial history. At the same time, it almost feels a little anticlimactic because if you've been paying attention at all, you knew this was going to happen anyways. You knew that the finance minister was signaling even in December that this was going to happen. And I always say when a politician says maybe, they mean yes. And he said this year, maybe we'll have a surplus in December. So we knew this was going to happen. I guess, you know, the thing for me with the budget is this is a budget that is a that is a political budget it's coming, of course, two months before a leadership review. And I think everything for Jason Kenney, of course, and I think everything has to be viewed through that lens. I think you hit the the nail right on the head there. I mean, this could be the or the subject matter of our entire conversation, and we'll certainly return there. Graham, the premier, was quick to point out. He really was was very clear. He kind of spelled it out to Albertans just a couple of days ago. He said, "Yes, we are benefiting from high oil prices. That's undeniable." He says, "But the types of numbers that you're going to see in Alberta's budget would not happen without the fiscal restraint that we have shown. How much credit does this government and this premier deserve?" For balanced books. Well, listen, they have put a lid on spending, which, of course, is a a double edged blade when it comes to spending on things like health and education and and other areas. But it really still is the two things, the price of oil, for which Kenny has no control, but also the uh, the the payout uh, from royalties in the oil sense. And more companies now are actually paying higher royalties. And that was because basically because of Ed Stelmack's plan from a decade ago. So it really still is because of the price of oil and more royalties coming in. That is not because of you know Kenny's um, leadership in the sense of getting Albertans back to work. Now, it, it did help putting a, a lid on spending. But the thing is, this surplus of $500 million is a lot of money you know, for you and I to spend. But for a government with a $62 billion budget, it's a very small it's a razor's edge in terms of a, uh, a surplus. Now, it can go either way. And Trevor Toome, the economist, has been following this so closely, and he's right. It, uh, we've seen, of course, the invasion of uh, Ukraine, and uh, this, this terrible, that that's going to spike, and it has spiked world oil prices. And that's going to help Alberta, and that's going to help the budget this year. But, of course, this there's still a possibility if it crashes again, the price crashes all of a sudden we're back into a huge deficit. This is a budget, of course, for the year, but again, as Kelly's pointed out, uh, it's all headed right now towards Kenny's leadership vote. And that's only about six weeks away. So if anything changes in this budget, it, it won't actually have an impact before Kenny's leadership vote. And right now, uh, he'll be pointing to this um, budget and the surplus, the um, balanced budget saying to Albertans and especially his own party members, look, I actually have turned things around. Well, of course, the world has turned things around for Alberta, but Kenny will take a lot of credit for this and he's going to hope it's going to save him and help him do a lot better than we think he might be doing heading into that leadership vote on April 9th. Yeah, well, so Kelly, to speak frankly, I, I don't think that much of the chagrin or much of the angst or anger that the premier would have faced from within his own party, quite frankly, had anything to do with budget or deficits or debt. And I think it had everything to do with his management of COVID and his management of his caucus and a and hundred other things that both of you have been uh, writing about a ton over the past couple of years. So is this budget enough to send a message where uh, Jason Kenney, not the premier of Alberta, but the leader of the United Conservative Party can say, in that meeting that is most likely going to be stacked with a friendly room. His operatives are strong and skilled and they know what they're doing and it's a strong machine. Is it enough for him to say, forget about this, that or the other? Let's focus on the money and the fact that Alberta's right on track where I said I'd put it within four years of being elected. Is it enough? It's not enough, but it had to be in place for him to make any case in the leadership review. This had to be in place. If it wasn't in place, Uh, we'd be having an entirely different conversation. UCP ran on an economic platform, mostly, and this had to be in place for him to make the case at all. Otherwise, he would be in a lot more trouble. You You can put it that way, but you're right. There are bigger issues at play. Alberta has been a place where we assume everything is linked to the economy. So many people come here for economic reasons and politicians more than even in other jurisdictions rise or fall based on the economy. But we've seen a couple of examples recently, like Ralph Klein, like Alison Redford, when leaders have been effectively dumped, even when times are relatively good. And I think that is a sign that people are not just looking for the economic 
goodness to be in place. They are they are asking questions about leadership and ethics. And of course, everybody's been through this two year battle, this pandemic, and it's left political scars. There's obviously a lot of mistrust and unhappiness in his caucus. And that that continues. I, I, I have another budget question, but but I'm not going to ignore the trend of this conversation nor where it's going. It's like when you get swept up into a river and you decide to just go with the rapids. And so I'm going to keep on the leadership conversation for a second. Um, Graham, I'm curious for your take on, on on how this is going to unfold. Obviously, there are some interesting things happening. You know, the Fort McMurray by-election being called Brian Jean, the nominee there, says he's essentially coming in, not even as a Trojan horse. He's just the soldier knocking on the door saying, I'm going to take down the leader. Uh, some people are speculating uh, whether or not the United Conservative Party will be able to remain united uh, before the next provincial election or whether we'll see a split again. And then there's, of course, a conversation about whether or not there's a, do I say, a worthwhile error uh, within the party and who that might be. Is there a real challenger to Jason Kenney's leadership? How do you see this going? I'm, I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball with a lot of factors at play. But what does the next year look like for Jason Kenney and the United Conservatives vis-a-vis Alberta's government? Well, going back to what uh, Kelly said about the, the balanced budget, this is part of a narrative. It, this in itself is not going to save him. But it, there's a narrative here, and he's building, and that is pointing to the fact that he is really a fiscal conservative. He's actually managed to balance the budget. And, of course, this was unthinkable a year or two ago. A year ago, absolutely unthinkable. Now it's balanced. But also, he's lifting restrictions on the pandemic. And that's going to help him. I mean, the people who are angry at him, Uh, in rural areas are angry at him because he's done, they feel too much on the the pandemic while he's lifting basically all the restrictions we expect that to happen uh, next week, March 1st. So you've got him trying to take the the wind out of the sails of people who are really grumpy at him over areas, issues like the the, the pandemic. That's interesting. A few, a month or so ago, I thought, you know, he's gonna win this leadership review, no problem. It's a one day vote the members have to be there in person to vote. And he could easily stack that meeting. We've seen in the past, Ed Stelmack and Alison Redford went through leadership uh, reviews when they were premier and they got 77%, even though they were deeply unpopular. Of course, they were both forced out uh, four months later for Alison Redford, but a year or so later for Ed Stelmack. So you can stack that meeting. But it's interesting that Kenny is worried because he now has... Pam Livingston, who's his chief of staff, is taking time off from being chief of staff to run a team to make sure Kenny survives that leadership race, that vote rather, because he's talked about you know people, uh, the angry truckers, the Coots blockade, people from that who are supporting that will go to that meeting and vote him out as leader. And there's no heir apparent. They're just really angry at Kenny. You want to take it out on him. But I think the fact that he's lifting restrictions will take the wind out of their sails. The fact that he's got a balanced budget he can point to is going to help. I think the, the fiscal conservatives say, yeah, maybe he is the guy. And then he's going to hope that the public opinion polls start to move his way between now and April 9th. Not a lot of time. They'll be doing a lot of polling to try and convince people that in fact he is more popular they can convince the party stick with him and don't change horses it's a year away till the next election end of may of next year not a lot of time in politics to get a new leader in place and then convince albertans that the ucp is being rebranded under under a new leader and as for your question about an heir apparent no because this is a pretty brand new party even though it comes out of the remnants of the old wild rose and pc party Kenny built this party. He's not grooming anybody to replace him. It's very much his party. He's built the party, which is why the caucus, even though there's a lot of grumbling in the caucus, they have a hard time organizing against him. He's a guy that works day and night. He will organize and keep organizing to win that all-important leadership vote on April 9th and then keep on going after that towards the next election. And then there'll be a budget next year. This is not a pre-election budget. The election's not till the end of May of next year. There's another budget coming in next February. They have to do it by the end of February. It's provincial law. So expect to see the government try and just hope that things keep going their way this year, that going back to that surplus, it's still a razor's edge. If things go either way, it could be a much higher surplus or a much lower surplus, depending on the all-important price of oil and natural gas. Kelly? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I also think, you know, 
Jason Kenney to now has done as well as possible as you could in handling Brian Jean, which is to basically ignore him. Um, you know, Brian Jean has run on this platform of opposing Jason Kenney, which you could argue is enough. But I think increasingly there's going to be scrutiny on Brian Jean if he is the only one who's putting himself out there to, to see if he has the chops to be a leader. And I think today is the, li- the day that the, the list of candidates is finalized for the Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche by-election. So we'll see if Brian Jean indeed makes it. Barring some last minute uh, politicking. Um, And uh, again, I think people will be watching and looking if there's any other potential candidates and be thinking about uh, the devil they know versus someone new. And I I think that will increasingly become a factor in this. And I think even even Jason Kenney is looking beyond the budget in a way. He, He sees the budget bacon. You heard it in the throne speech. The throne speech actually gave us more details in a way about what he's looking for for the party. He talked about, you know, making sure that people who are considering medically assisted dying get counseling, that there's other options. This to me looks like throwing things to the base. He talked, you know, he's he's talking very strong in terms of sanctions on Russia. Um, Charter and, schools. And, you know, Right, right. And these are all things that are very important to UCP members um, and and aren't necessarily issues for the broader Alberta public. So you do see those things thrown in there, but not necessarily through the budget. Great analysis from the two of you. Uh, In closing, I want to ask you this question uh, to circle back to the budget. I got a, a text yesterday from an Edmonton city councilor, won't say which one. And they said to me, we didn't get anything we asked for. I wonder why. And so I was wondering if the two of you could give me one example of a regional spend or or maybe a regional exclusion of a sign somewhere in the budget uh, that the spending is obviously political. That's not the first government to do it. But Kelly, is there one that immediately jumps to mind? For spending being political. Um, With regards to, you know, the government targeting. I know that you were maybe just going to say the hospital in Red Deer. Is that one? The hospital in Red Deer, hospital in Grand Prairie, I think yeah. there was two quick hospital. And, th- and those are people, obviously, in the city where the vote will take place, but also in rural areas where hospitals is a very big concern. Um, that was there. And yeah. yeah. And again, no, no extra help for post-secondary, which has been a target for this government in yeah. a major way. You saw the U of, U, U of A. Uh, talk about also they could have used more funding as well yeah well we'll expect to see i think some labor disruptions at post-secondary institutions in alberta stay tuned for that uh, graham last word uh, to you one spend or, or or one uh tightening of the purse string that jumped out to you and struck you as especially political well edmonton you got the mayor speaking about this uh amarjeet so he's made a point of saying look he's been talking to the government he has he's been making an effort to try and build bridges with them and then edmonton got, they said, basically nothing in the budget. Now, they were looking for about $9 million, for example, for supportive housing. Didn't get that at all. I asked um, Travis Taves, the finance minister, about this yesterday, and he said, look, you know, uh, spending goes around at the province. Uh, we spend in different areas uh, each year. So, you know, so any, sort of, any sort of suggestion that I'll, Edmonton's being punished, he said, is ludicrous, is no way. But you got to wonder, you know, politically, Edmonton has only one UCP MLA, the rest are all NDP MLAs, and the mayor is a former cabinet minister in the Trudeau government. And uh, so you gotta wonder, because you know, it, op- in, in politics, optics is everything. And Edmonton got a lot less money this year in this budget than Calgary did. Yeah. Graham Thompson, uh, you can read his work. Uh, you can see him on the CBC, iPolitics, Alberta Views, and Kelly Kreiderman. Make sure you read her great work in the Globe and Mail. Really appreciate both of your availability this morning. Thanks for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you. You bet. Our Real Talk Roundtable coming up in uh, just one minute. Uh, Sue Muncaster is going to be telling us the story of her brother. This is a personal family story. She shared it in the Huffington Post. Her brother, a conspiracy theorist, investigative journalist Justin Ling, will join us, as will Anna Merlin. Anna is the author of Republic of Lies. We're going to talk about conspiracy theories, how they get started, why they spread. Uh, in my mind, in plain language, why some people believe so many unbelievable things. Quite frankly, how does this all happen 
Can I tell you first about what we're sipping on in studio this month? Uh, we're proud to partner with Yegg Coffee Club. You can find them online at yeggcoffeeclub.ca. This is your opportunity to have local Edmonton coffee delivered right to your door. On the 15th of every month, they send it out from a different local roaster, which means you get to try something new every month. This month, we're drinking, uh, these are amazing, the Mexico Chiapas beans. Uh, this is an exclusive for Yegg Coffee Club, uh, roasted by Dapper Beaver uh, with hints of white chocolate baked apples mild acidity we're really loving it who knows what next month's coffee will be sometimes they'll pass along with treats as well like this month we got these bulldozer bites these little kind of like granola bar type thingies uh mocha flavored you never know it's always a surprise again delivered right to your door you subscribe today uh each box and you can get as many as you want maybe your workplace needs 10 pounds of coffee a month they can accommodate maybe it's just you at home you need one pound and that's plenty uh, you're going to try it all out you customize your order and then of course you wait the 15th of the month there it is plus you can get your yegg coffee club official mug i love mine i have it here in studio too all of it at yeggcoffeeclub.ca Wanted to let you know about that uh, opportunities right now. I know that some of you are, are looking at picking up a new rig. Uh, you know, you, it's still time to talk about four wheel drive in the winter. Those roads can get slippery. You get the freezing rain sometimes through the spring. And then all of a sudden it's time to start figuring out what's going to tow your boat, your trailer, what's going to take you into those trailheads, the backcountry adventures. Why not take a look at the Jeep lineup? the Ram lineup, and everything else under the Dodge Jeep brands with the best selection in the province at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. You'll find both of those dealerships under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Shop them online or in person and let them know you heard about them on Real Talk. Well, this piece was uh, one that struck us the minute that we saw it at huffpost.com. Under the HuffPost personal Brand reads the headline from the piece published January 21st by Sue Moncaster. My gentle, intelligent brother is now a conspiracy theorist and his beliefs are shocking. Now, if you're probably one of those that's paying at least a little bit of attention to what's been happening here in Canada, in the United States, uh, most particularly back that January 6th insurrection and around the world, it's undeniable that conspiracy theories tend to be or appear to be going more mainstream. But how do they happen? How do they come about? Why do so many people fall for them, quite frankly? I want to have a meaningful conversation here driven by your feedback in our live chat and using our hashtag Real Talk. RJ Sue Muncaster, the author of that very personal piece, is a, an author and an activist who lives in Teton Valley, Idaho, where she serves on Victor City Council works as a communications manager for the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board. What an unbelievable part of the world. Uh, again, she published in the Huffington Post back in January. Anna Merlin is a journalist and a senior staff writer at Vice. Uh, she's the author of the 2019 book Republic of Lies, American Conspiracy Theorists and Their Surprising Rise to Power. And if you follow federal politics in Canada, you no doubt know Justin Lang, a freelance investigative journalist that's really been focusing on misinformation, conspiracy theories, extremism, policing, and national security. Uh, you've read his work most recently in McLean's, The Daily Beast, The Guardian, and of course, many other publications. It means a lot to have the three of you here for what I know, Sue, for you is going to be a personal conversation. It's, it's not every person that would be willing to put their family dynamic out there for public consumption. What took you to that point, Sue? Sorry, I'm trying to fix my face here. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll get that <laughs> sorted out. We'll get it figured out. But what okay. prompted what prompted you to start typing out the personal story about your brother's journey into conspiracy theories? Uh, well, um, he showed up on our doorstep in Idaho um, after basically saying that he wasn't going to have any contact with us back in April and um, had dinner with him and my family and I started hearing all the things that he believed in. And some of it was pretty mainstream stuff like Trump is still president, that kind of thing. But then he started talking about underground tunnels between LA and uh, Florida and something that's going around all of Australia that, you know, it just started getting super weird. And then we found out he had a TikTok channel and started watching him on TikTok. And then he started his family relationships started falling apart. So after it's all in the article, kind of my first experience with 
um, how deep he'd always, he'd gone. He'd always been a bit, um, you know, super distrustful of the government, very libertarian, healthy distrust of corporations, et cetera. And then this was the, when we really realized that he had gone in deep and uh, it took me eight months to write the thing because I was so concerned about causing more division and making things worse and, and hurting my brother or his family. But I eventually just thought it was such a a issue for our country and our nation. And that I, I felt like it was something that needed to be talked about. Anna, you literally wrote the book on this, right? Republic of lies, American conspiracy theorists, their surprising rise to power. You've probably heard many of these types of stories, Uh, Someone Mm -hmm. like Sue. Sue picks the word intelligence. She says, my gentle, intelligent brother is falling for these conspiracy theories. How does this typically get started? I mean, what did you learn through the course of writing your book? So conspiracy theories are very, very common in the U.S. As many as one in three of us believe in at least one conspiracy theory. Um, A lot of conspiracy theories are focused on Um, distrust of the government. Um, Conspiracy theories have grown as the size of the federal government in the U.S. has grown. Uh, And yeah, I mean, the idea that an intelligent person can, you know, quote unquote, fall for a conspiracy theory is uh, is true, is common, is often, you know, what starts as as Sue is saying, um, a distrust, a healthy distrust of power, authority, um, calling into question sort of established narratives. But for some folks, depending on what's going on in their lives and their sort of predispositions, it can lead to unhealthy or, you know, occasionally violent places. But the impulse to engage in conspiracy thinking is kind of with all of us. Justin, is this, it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, I, I know that there are people that, that throughout the course of history, I mean, the, the one that pops in my mind right now is people that believe that the moon landing was faked. I mean, there's people that believe all kinds of things don't even get us started on JFK's assassination. Right. But are these really ramping up or do we just notice it more because of social media? Everybody's got a platform. I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I think there's there's different types of conspiracy theories, right? And as Anna knows very, very well, uh, you know, there is a type of conspiracy theory that's sort of um, maybe an almost a hobby belief, right? You know, I believe the moon landing was faked because I don't trust the, the videos that I've seen or the pictures that I've seen, right? That is the sort of innocuous conspiracy theory that does not lead most people to really do anything. They sort of just have a skepticism uh, of the official narrative of state media, uh, of the government, and it leads them to conclude that things don't really add up. Ditto for the JFK assassination. It's one of those things where people just can't accept that the president has been shot, much less by a lone gunman sitting in the fourth floor of a a book depository. So I think that there's there's types of conspiracy theories that are just kind of um, always present. There's always sort of a bubbling reality of people who are going to uh, come up with sort of alternative explanations for things they have a hard time accepting. But there is another stream of conspiracy theory, and I think it's one that you're seeing grow more prevalent in recent years. It's the type of conspiracy theory that describes QAnon, um, that describes uh, many folks around uh, President Donald Trump and and many who uh, occupied the Capitol uh, of Ottawa just this past few weeks. And it's this this, this belief that there is a broader power structure at play and that it is um, so powerful as to sort of move entire governments, countries, uh, or even the entire world, but also has this impact on your daily life. And it pushes people into these um, incredibly isolated alternate realities, in essence. And this is not particularly new. You go back to 1906 uh, with the creation of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It is a document that has helped people believe, whether it's in Russia, Germany, the US, or elsewhere, that there is a secret cabal of Jewish bankers who really run the world and are really, you know, in, in personal terms for people, are the reason why you're poor or the reason why you're destitute or the reason why you're having a hard time getting ahead, even as there are rich people kind of dining on fancy steaks. You go right up through the 60s, uh, the John Birch Society told people there was a secret communist plot uh, that was afoot and that was controlling the White House. Uh, You come to the 90s, the Patriot Movement argued that um, the Bilderberg Group and a whole bunch of others uh, were orchestrating a a, a new one world government that would remove your sovereignty and your personal autonomy. And you bring that right up to present day. And that is uh, present in QAnon. Uh, Many of the people who occupied the Capitol believed that the World Economic Forum is really pulling the strings behind Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau 
and others. So these sort of things have been around for a long time, but I think it's fair to say they're picking up momentum and they're finding new constituencies in places we weren't quite expecting. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned the World Economic Forum, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like you know, he's not yet in the Hall of Fame, but you think of one of Canada's most prominent NHL alumni, Theron Fleury, tweeting nonstop about Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. And then you've got hundreds of thousands of people that are going to believe whatever Theo says. And then all of a sudden it's, it's somewhat legitimized, I guess, in a way. Uh, Anna, I, I don't quite know how to ask the question because I recognize I'm, 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 I'm in, in a way inadvertently painting a whole bunch of people with a really broad brush. But through history, as Justin outlines it, I mean, are these are these the same folks I mean, are they people that grew up in 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 uh, like either an evangelical or a sort of an anti-intellectual? And I'm going to face fire for that, putting those two together. But the, the point being, are these people with similar upbringing, similar backgrounds, similar political perspectives through the years? Or, or do we see this across the spectrum? Yeah, no, conspiracy theory is really cut across um, certainly uh race, class, and gender lines. Um, people with lower levels of educational attainment are slightly more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, but even that is not super consistent. Um, the one thing that we can say is that people are more prone to engage in conspiracy thinking when they feel at risk, when they feel endangered. So times of social change and social upheaval, we see more conspiracy theories. Um, folks who are facing some form of financial or personal instability are much more likely to sort of engage in what I would describe as the deep end of the pool, you know, levels of conspiracy thinking that can be actively disruptive to their lives. Um, There's a really famous study in New Jersey in the early 90s about how folks who engage in conspiracy thinking are more likely to also be experiencing what the researcher called anomia, this sort of pessimism about their own personal circumstances, about whether things were going to get better for them personally or whether the government cared about them personally. So um, disaffection with the social and political structure as it stands is a great predictor of your sort of willingness sometimes to engage in conspiracy thinking. Sue, you write powerfully uh, at HuffPost.com, your piece about your brother. You say, as a Libra, uh, I pride myself on finding balance. You say, as a local politician, I'm committed to listening to a variety of perspectives, seeking common ground in pursuit of the best solutions. Dealing with my brother has challenged the core principles of compassion, inaction, and harmony that I hold dear as a student of Taoism and, and Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, what was the impact uh, of sharing your thoughts, your observations, the story of your brother? What did it do to your relationship with him and the family and, and the bigger picture? So as I, re- I wrote in the story, I did run through this by my brother. He's seen the whole article. And um, one of the things that he holds dear is uh, freedom of speech. And he, he asked me to, you know, encourage me to, to publish it. Uh, since the, the, we, we had some family drama just before the article came out and really I've had almost no uh, interaction with him since then. Um, so he has really, you know, just to put my personal story in, in context of what Justin, both Justin and Anna really uh, outlined all of the things that led to my brothers um, going into the deep end of the pool. But I mean, to answer your earlier question, we are a very privileged family, highly educated, not evangelical. Um, So, you know, all of those sort of stereotypes don't fit here. so I'm not getting texts, you know, what would make me crazy is when he would send me these just outrageous videos that uh, were so infuriating and circular conversations that there was no answer to. So that hasn't really been happening. But really, at this point, everybody's just disenfranchised and he's living in a car. He's left his family. Um, he's super downtrodden in his videos, so uh, I'm not really sure what's going to happen next. Hmm. I've got some really interesting comments, and, and people are sharing personally in our live chat right now. People that are watching us on YouTube, you know, you know, one says, for example, this is Alicia. I'm starting to feel sympathy for people who are so far down the rabbit hole. Like, what must that be like, living in constant paranoia or constant fear or anger? Others are saying, well, I mean, what should you do? I mean, you know, Tracy says, this sounds super narrow-minded, I know, uh, but 
but how do well-educated people fall for this stuff? Uh, Justin, you've wrote about this, and, and in particular, the link. I mean, Canada warned before these protests, the occupation, border blockades, bridge blockades started that that violent extremists had infiltrated the convoy. That was certainly evident with the seizure of that uh, cache of weapons at the Coots border uh, heading into Montana, just south of Lethbridge. Did it reiterate to you, or should it reiterate to Canadians that, that some of these these theories, this diagonal, for example, this theory of this community that's going to go crazy, like it's so easily laughed off. It's, but maybe that is not the responsible or prudent course of action. Let, let, let me let's talk about the kind of different components of, of these conspiracy movements, right? You know, we should feel sympathy, um, you know, for for, for folks who, who fall down these rabbit holes. People like Sue's brother, they're not bad people. And actually, what you tend to find is that if you write them off as um, extremists, far right extremists, racist, misogynists, so on and so forth, oftentimes the people you meet don't comport with that reality. They may ascribe to a conspiracy theory that is all of those things, that is anti science, that is um, misogynistic, racist, so on and so forth, like QAnon. But you'll find the individual members will be just horrified at those those descriptions. They'll say, you know, you know my my best, and, and not to sound too too much like a trope, but you know, my best friend is black, or you know, I went to a school with with a predominant Muslim population, so on and so forth. You you hear these people who are genuinely horrified to think that they may be a part of something you know that extreme, and when they hear those descriptions, they tend to draw back even further and say, well, you know, if that's what the mainstream says, they're all in on it, right? They're out there to smear us. And this is a, the sentiment you hear constantly. Um, and these people, there's various reasons why they fall into this, right? You actually hear a ton of uh, instances, uh, especially kind of anti-vaccine conspiracy theorists and many who've fallen down the rabbit hole in this world economic form thing. You hear them say, you know, I lost my best friend to suicide during the pandemic. You know, I lost family members, you know, I experienced express my opinion and people cut me out. They, they have these actual stories of loss that push them into this narrow worldview and into a community where everyone around them is super supportive, right? You have other people who say, I lost people to suicide as well. And, and they find a common enemy in the World Economic Forum or the government or the vaccines or Pfizer or what have you. And there's something really, really reassuring about that. And that for most people is much more compelling than any sort of demonization of, of refugees or, or queer people or, or what have you. But, and here's you know, where the folks like Diagolon come in, there are always people in these movements who are extremists. Sometimes they were extremists before they got into the movement. Sometimes they became extremists after. Sometimes you even see extremists uh, knowingly take advantage of these groups, recognizing that they are essentially brainwashed and that brainwashed people can be made to do truly horrific things. You have seen uh, numerous uh, neo-Nazi far-right extremist movements who have tapped into these conspiracy uh, channels and have weaponized people to their own ends. Much like uh, the Islamic states, you know, did an incredible job of tapping into uh, anti-Western government uh, sentiments here to recruit foreign fighters and domestic extremists. And finally, you have the politicians who know that all of this is is completely absurd, know how baseless these conspiracy theories are, but recognize that you know, much like those extremists, recognize they can be tapped into for their own political ends. I don't think Donald Trump understands even remotely what QAnon is or what it believes. I know know he sees them as an incredibly powerful grassroots uh, movement that he can use to his own ends. Ditto here in Canada. You've seen Pierre Polyev and members of the Conservative Party uh, use this occupation and use this uh, this anxiety around the World Economic Forum for their own political ends. It's absolutely, and they're probably the most blameworthy of the whole bunch, just because they know this is wrong. And they know what they're doing is feeding into this, this intense uh, polarization in our society. And they're weaponizing it for their own for their own ambition and it, it's frankly you know one of the most abhorrent parts of this whole problem uh, that's a, such a good point and Anna I want to ask you about Donald Trump and we'll go there in a second but Justin uh, took us to Pierre Polyev and I think it's 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 an important point because a lot of people are talking about not just who the conservative party is flirting with or did flirt with uh, with this Ottawa occupation but who they essentially got into bed with uh, you know essentially uh, consummated a relationship it almost felt like people talking about chickens that could come home to roost and the risks that a conservative party could take uh, with regards to, to these types of relationships or, or almost these these vague endorsements of these types of illegal blockades what risk does the conservative party run what risk does Pierre Polyev in particular run with these types of bedfellows 
Unfortunately, I don't think there's much risk at all right now. The media in Canada, to, to a lesser degree, I think, in the media in the States, have been totally toothless in actually criticizing politicians who do this, who play this game. They have been totally unwilling to call what this is what it truly is, right? You know, when Pierre Polyev first started um, spreading disinformation about the World Economic Forum last year, the media in Canada wrung its hands and said, well, you know, he's not really part of the conspiracy theory. He's making a point about the broad and we have been completely unwilling to engage with this critically. So I don't think there will be consequences. There, there haven't been consequences for numerous uh, politicians in Canada, the US and in Europe who have played footsie with these conspiracy theorists and have done it to great effect. I think Pierre Polyev is looking at the conspiracy laden uh, People's Party of Canada and, and, and going, he's going to go to that well for as many votes as possible. And I think he's probably going to have some success with it. And we're just going to have to deal with the consequences. And I don't think he frankly cares. Mm -hmm. Anna, what's your assessment? I mean, with regards to the the, the end game of this and what this could ultimately look like, uh, your observations based on what you've seen, most particularly in researching your book. Right. I mean, I think the point that Justin is making is important, which is that for a number of sort of would-be autocratic leaders, um, conspiracy theories have been incredibly powerful, especially in the last few years. They're um, an amazing tool to coalesce your base around a common enemy and to convince them that, you know, you alone have the policies or, you know, steps necessary to, uh, to fight whatever the evildoer of the moment is, you know, and obviously we've seen this for a really long time, you know, well before COVID, well before Donald Trump, the idea of demonizing a common enemy has been incredibly effective. And it is, you know, the sort of core tool uh, the core way that conspiracy theories are used as a political tool. Um, what is, of course, super interesting in the moment right now is between the convoy protests, both in Canada and now in the U.S., um, and the sort of like overwhelming number of medical conspiracies that have come out during COVID is that uh, we have more and more people who, at least on the surface, are not just engaged in some level of conspiracy thinking, but are using it to make very basic, very intimate decisions about their own lives, their health, how they're going to spend their money, how they're going to spend their time. Um, and I think what's important to recognize is that that isn't going to necessarily shift for everyone after these current crises are over. You know, the people who have spent the last few weeks occupying, um, you know, Ottawa, the people who are now driving towards D.C., um, when this current moment has passed, they are still going to carry the same sense of grievance, the same sense that they have been somehow treated unfairly or that, you know, vaccine uh, mandates or other kinds of COVID restrictions have fallen on them in ways that they didn't fall on other people. And that sense of grievance is very profitable. Um, in my book, I make a really strong distinction between conspiracy peddlers and conspiracy consumers. And conspiracy peddlers see this moment as a, as a time to make money. Um, the journalist Talia Lavin wrote something really insightful for her newsletter about the ways that the convoy groups on Telegram have become sites for all kinds of scammy sort of sales pitches. It's something that we've been seeing too. You know, um, a lot of these folks are seeing the moment of the convoy and the moment of the sort of crises around COVID restrictions as a way to grow their audience for the next thing. So um, the most concrete example here in the US is that the convoy that began in California is essentially being um, promoted and sort of co-sponsored by the um, frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, which is a group that promotes ivermectin, which is a discredited uh, COVID treatment that all available evidence suggests doesn't really work. Um, but essentially what that means is that the people who are promoting ivermectin, the people behind this group are seeing the folks who are engaged by the convoy as a useful audience, as folks who might be sympathetic to what they are quite literally selling. And so we should be really aware of the ways that various kinds of uh, conspiracy entrepreneurs and sort of fringe um, health or political experts are going to use this moment to try to bring a new audience into whatever it is they're planning next. Sue, I want to ask you about that convoy in a second, but Justin, I can tell you're chomping at the bit to jump in on that. <laughs> Just going to say briefly, because Anna makes a, a fantastic point about how conspiracy theories become fodder for autocrats. Um, you know, in this country, um, it's partly it's partially started in, in, in Hungary, but in this country, in the U.S., you know, we've spent years demonizing George Soros as as the author of all misfortune, right? As as the the, the grand pumbaa of all progressive left wing movement movements. Our 
contribution to that conspiracy theory has become so ingrained in how Russia attacks Ukraine into how uh, Viktor Orban, uh, you know, discredits his opposition. We we deserve an enormous amount of credit. We we should get a we should get a contri- you know contributing a byline on the the efforts by these countries to to destroy their political opponents. Um, you have seen uh, you know actual you know propaganda that borrows from from our conspiracy theorists here in order to justify war in Europe. It's absolutely uh, obscene, and we don't seem to appreciate how peddling and, and, and platforming these conspiracy theories can do enormous damage to the world order. Again, our politicians don't seem to care. Uh, and those who are making money off this don't seem to care either. And again, Anna's very, very right. You know, I, I had someone in one of those Telegram channels trying to sell me a fake uh, CDC vaccine card for, for 100 bucks American. There's right. other people who've been using uh, troll farms to sell the convoy t-shirts um, by mimicking some of these Facebook pages. So there, there's absolutely money to be made here. There's votes to be had here but it's doing real damage no kidding i mean money to be made at what cost uh as a rhetorical question sue as an american uh you know when you 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 were not far removed from january 6 2021 i mean i uh, somebody came at me yesterday took great issue with the fact i said you know there's pearl harbor there's september 11th there's january 6th i mean it's right up there uh the insurrection was i know extremely troubling of course to people around the world in particular americans when you saw what happened with canada's convoy uh and that coots blockade not too far from you by the way in idaho the occupation of ottawa the blocking of the bridge some of the signs that flew confederate flags swastikas and the like uh do you perceive or do you view this american convoy headed to dc right now differently uh having seen that insurrection on january 6th of 2021 um you know interestingly enough i uh am very much impacted by a hour long program I heard on the daily, the New York times, the daily about the convoys. And this woman went around and she interviewed all these people and it was really striking. Yes. She said there were conspiracy theorists. Yes. There was extremists. Yes. There was um, white supremacists, but there was so many everyday people who were just trying to speak up for uh, their rights and less government control and, you know, some, some great subjects. So with this, with this convoy coming across the country, um, I'm, I I would not say I'm fearful. I'm so hopeful for our country. I honestly, you know, everybody's worried about, are we going to have a civil war? Are we going to this? Are we going to that? And then you watch the Super Bowl and you watch hundreds and thousands of black and white people uh, collaborating together on, human excellence and it's so hopeful so i think there's a lot of focus on the negativity of these things and i do think they have a positive aspect as well um so yes people are taking advantage people are um being disgusting so some of the politicians are disgusting but I'm, i'm hopeful for our country i really believe that there is so and canada she this woman in this daily if you haven't heard it you should listen to it she <laughs> I, is so complimentary of oh, I, I feel exactly opposite and I, I, justin <laughs> take it. What, so, what, what makes you feel opposite i was in i was in ottawa when that episode aired and um it is uh, a very, you know, we were talking earlier about about the need to be skeptical and sort of forceful in how we deal with conspiracy theories. And there was just a profound lack of curiosity in that in the New York Times piece. I understand how it, it sounded like it had all the trappings of you know, a hard hitting piece. But, um, you know, I spoke to many of the same people I've, I've focused on many of the same people and can tell you conspiracy theories ran so deeply in an occupation. So I do think you're right. You know, this is still fundamentally a small group of people. Many of the people who are heading to Washington right now are the same people who were there on January 6th, some of whom were arrested, some of whom were not. Um, so, you know, to some degree, I think maybe the coverage of this tends to make these, these movements feel bigger than they actually are. But fundamentally, you're right. America is fundamentally not deranged in this way, right? America, while there are support for, you know, many kind of more, you know, more innocuous conspiracy theories, America is by and large, not of the belief that the election was stolen, not of the belief that um, there's a secret cabal of people uh, you know, kidnapping children are not of the belief that George Soros secretly runs the world. It is a small fringe of society who unfortunately take up an enormous amount of space uh, for, for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, and, and for context, Sue, I'll let you know a lot of Canadians are pissed at the New York Times right now for, for how they characterized <laughs> our <laughs> occupation and the Emergencies Act. So everybody's a little touchy about the New York Times understanding <laughs> of Canada right now. Um, Anna, I want to I want to ask you this in closing. This is a story that's kind of, I guess, in a way being buried a little bit. And, and I guess that provides great context for the question. And that is the launch of Truth Social, uh, which is former President Donald Trump. <laughs> Look at uh, people on the podcast will not have seen your eyes just wide and like dinner plates and you took a deep Deep breath as you prepare to answer my question. Uh, this is Donald. Uh-huh. This is Donald Trump's new social network. I guess it was about a year ago he was starting to be deplatformed from social media sites, most prominently probably Twitter, but there were many, even Pinterest. And people wondered whether or not that's safe or unsafe, whether that's wise or unwise to deplatform uh, these types of conversations. What do you make of Truth Social, and how does that fit into the context of what we're talking about today? So um, there have been an enormous number of new social media networks that are focused on um, giving voice to people who strongly believe that they have been deplatformed or censored in some way. Um, the main complaint with True Social right now, like with all of these new platforms, is that it's very buggy. <laughs> Um, I would also really advise folks to read the terms of service for any of these new platforms. Um, They often promise to be very privacy focused and often take an enormous amount of information from folks. I have not read the truth social uh, terms of service yet, so I don't know if that's true Uh, for that one in particular. uh, I will say that pretty much what tends to happen here is that there is an enormous interest in trying to find an alternative to Twitter because Twitter is sort of where the broadest public conversation is happening. Uh, And most of these sites struggle to do that. Uh, At the same time, Truth Social and all of these other sites are an example of something that's been happening for a long time, which is, you know, an emerging and increasingly sort of varied um, alternative news and social media network. You know, uh, every day I get on Telegram and I look at what people are talking about on Telegram, and this is all of the anti-vaccine, conspiracy entrepreneur, other types of folks that I follow. And I will tell you that like the very basic news that they're focused on is entirely different than what's going on in the mainstream. Yeah. Or even something like Russia's invasion of Ukraine is interpreted very differently. Um, for instance, on a lot of these alternative platforms, the belief is that um, somehow the Russian invasion of Ukraine is meant to distract from the convoys leaving from the various parts of the United States. How that would possibly work, I don't know. Um, But basically what we see emerging here is a wider and wider gulf between quote unquote mainstream news and what folks on these alternative platforms are talking about, what they believe to be true, the sources of information they consider to be good or reliable. Um, And that is only going to get worse and it is going to contribute to, you know, an already enormous polarization and just very basic facts about how we all understand the world. So I would not say that I feel, uh, incredibly optimistic at this moment about, um, you know, our national cohesion as Americans. Uh, I would not say that we're seeing a ton of particularly hopeful, um, currents in the world right now, but, uh, I will say that if people feel that they can speak their piece on Truth Social and they feel that it is a better platform for them, uh, great, you know, more power to them. Hmm. That's Anna Merlin, uh, senior staffer at Vice, uh, a journalist and, of course, author of Republic of Lies, American conspiracy theorists and their surprising rise to power. It's been great to have Justin Ling here as well, investigative journalist. You can read his work all over the place, obviously, including McLean's Daily Beast Guardian. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, doing a great job there. Uh, and Sue Muncaster, you can read her very personal piece at HuffPost.com. My gentle, intelligent brother, now a conspiracy theorist, his beliefs are are shocking to the three of you thanks for a lively informative insightful conversation it's how we love to wrap our broadcast week we appreciate your time thank you thanks for having me you got Ryan. it that was a great conversation and thanks to the three of you i, th- I have a feeling this is going to resonate with with some of you i mean i know i've even seen in the live chat some of you saying that you know family interactions for you have changed now they're either very basic or maybe there are even estranged relationships others of you and it's it, it's pretty uh understandable you, you you would say i i love this person in my life and I'm, I'm devastated or i'm troubled that they're feeling a certain way and i can't understand how they got here but they're not the type of person i can just write off if you want to wrap your mind around it maybe take a few days walk with it and then send us an email you can do it to talk at ryanjesperson.com we're going to get into a few emails in just a second you know speaking of friday traditions but first let me remind you that eden landscaping is bringing outdoor spaces to life and you don't want to wait until the daffodils and the tulips are popping up in april before you get in touch with your landscape designer 
at Eden Landscaping because their design process starts. They got to pull permits. They got to order construction materials. This is after the design is approved by you. This has to be your dream space, right? And then the build begins as soon as they can get into it. Of course, some of their construction happens around the year. They're doing outdoor cooking spaces and just beautiful fixtures. You can check out all of their work, their portfolio, the services they provide, including excavation, by the way, at landscapeedmonton.ca. And again, our congratulations to our friends at Local Environmental Services. You've known them as Local Waste. Their rebrand comes with a big expansion. They're growing their footprint in the prairies in Alberta and Saskatchewan and doing more and more to ensure all your needs are met when it comes to garbage and recycling collection, water hauling, fencing, portable toilets. They do landfill services. They've got vacuum trucks. Uh, You can right now go get a quote for free. Find out what life looks like with a better relationship with local environmental services at localenvironmental.ca. Every Friday, our friends at Local Environmental give us an opportunity to to blow off a little steam, to to hammer out an email to Real Talk and to have it considered for a high-octane, turned-up-to-ten segment we call Trash Talk! We lead off with this one from Mike. He sent this in this morning. He says, just a quick one here, Jess, but it's interesting to me that those that have long been opposed of accepting refugees from various uh, non-white countries are quick to welcome Ukrainians fleeing war. I guess as long as you're from a mostly white country, then you've checked the only box that matters to them. It's pretty sad. That said, sincerely, hopefully, those fleeing get to where they need to be safe travels to all. That from Mike. What about this one from Nicole, who says, I'm writing with regards to an interview that you did on on February the 14th with three high school students. It was extremely one-sided. I'm the parent of three young men that attend this school. A very large portion of these kids, you remember this, this was the walkout protest, are not against the Premier, and they're not against the, his masking views. As a matter of fact, I've spoken to many of my son's friends, and I find that most of the students I've spoken to are open to choice. If you want to wear a mask, fine. If you don't, fine. In this interview, one of your students stated that she attends what she calls, quote, a bit of a redneck school. This is a derogatory comment. Many parents and students take offense to this. Mounds of successful students and teachers attend, graduate, and work at this very professional school and do not deserve the title of being rednecks. Depending on the source, this depicts an uneducated, typically white, mid- to lower-class working person who is crass and unsophisticated. It is commonly associated with the terms cracker, hillbilly, and white trash. This story on Real Talk leaves me wondering why students on the other side of the fence were not part of this show, at least in order to defend themselves against being referred to as rednecks. That from Nicole. Thanks for having your say. This from Daniel, who says, why are more and more people not trusting mainstream media? You know that no journalists, not even Ryan, do reports without heavy editing. These edits cause a bias that most would describe as bending the truth or even attacking groups. Why has a story happened? Going past speculation to find root causes doesn't always happen. Otherwise, the story may never be published. The journalist may not profit. Everybody's scared to say something that may upset others. Their fear keeping them in the dark. Please do better. This from Daniel, who says, if you don't, I fear in the end, you will feel guilt and you do not deserve that. At least try to ask why a radicalized left is socially acceptable, but a radicalized right is not, says Daniel. Please keep me anonymous as I work with everyone, left and right, in hopes that true peace can be reached for those caught in the middle. You got it, Daniel. Not his real name. How about this one from Morgan, who says, I am sick and tired of being told to find unity with the dregs of our society, who for the last two years haven't given a crap about anybody else skirting the rules, only doing the bare minimum because they were forced to while kicking and screaming the whole way. So instead of telling me to find unity with them, how about they open a fucking book and listen to science and cut the conspiracy bullshit and remember that they actually live in a functioning society and try being a member of it then we can pursue unity that from morgan how about this one from robert who says your vaccine status is not your identity the tribalism i see is worrying me the words and things coming from people shocks me he says i get that we've all been fear level max 10 for two years but at some point this will become endemic and we will move on from this virus what people will not forget is how they were treated and by whom the example i don't know my cousin and i will ever recover from her suggesting that this was a thing about nazis and the holocaust i can't sort out if i was the jewish person or the Nazi in her villain story, but whatever. Maybe this utopian theoretical world I want but refuse to hate and I wish everyone else wouldn't either. Vaccinated or vaccinated. I grew up as a result of a challenging childhood and I firmly believe that hurt people 
hurt people. So let's be kind to one another. That from Robert. That sounded actually a little positive for Trash Talk. My apologies. I could have kept it in a different tone of voice. This one from Anne, who says, I know that it's wrapped up. I know they're on their way home. But I can't stop thinking about the kids, the children in this convoy, the cleanliness in the air, or lack thereof, really bad when trucks are parked and idling and particulates can enter the lungs. And uh, what about the other facts, like noise going over like 80 decibels consistently for long periods of time, a risk of hearing loss? What about all these concerned parents who are housing their kids in trucks, enslaving them to an unhealthy future? Why make your child a shield for your stupidity? That from Anne. And this one from Adam, who says, uh, Jesperson, I want to apologize. Apologize for all my emails lately. Adam, angry Adam, writes in often. Don't you ever stop, Adam? He says to be John. To be honest, I generally just write them as therapy. Uh, when the world parks like two inches from my passenger door, and it could have parked anywhere in a completely empty parking lot, and I feel the urge to lay down across the front seats and with all my might kick my door open with two feet like I'm Chuck Norris exiting a clown car. He says, and yeah, sometimes when I type it out, it gets me even more agitated than I've been in past. I know it's ironic that I'm telling you to not pay attention to all my emails in an email, but I think you'll get the gist. Just throw them in the whenever you have time folder. Sending them makes me feel like I'm contributing to something again. Something I've missed since finishing high school. I didn't even get to finish my last semester on campus, so maybe I'm just searching for closure. He says, nobody needs too much angry, Adam. But thank you for the work and the vigor. And it's not just a breath of fresh air for society. It's the life support machine society is currently hooked up to. Well, Adam, to be characterized as your life support means the world to us and the team. So don't you dare keep your thoughts to yourself. You can send us your trash talk anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com coming up early next week our coverage will continue of course russia's invasion of ukraine will be following the alberta budget the implications and everything else developing monday you will not want to miss former canadian diplomat chris alexander he'll be joining us as part of a star-studded lineup right here on real talk in the meantime make sure you like share subscribe to our content and tell all your friends you heard it on real talk Have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon.